all of them. Can you see Voss? No, he's not there yet. Are we on? Yeah. There's Mark Lloyd. <clears throat> <clears throat> I said Shabbat Shalom to all. It's not really 11.30 yet, so. Can hear us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Timothy Thompson says Shabbat Shalom, y'all, from Amman, Jordan. Why aren't you talking then? I'm talking. I'm waiting for people to get on. Oh. You have to give them a little time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a lot of people are starting to get on there. We're up to 22 people. What's that? Fine. What's the matter? It's eleven thirty. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm going to do it. There we go. We're going to start here in a minute, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Twenty nine folks here, all over the world. Really good stuff. Well, it's um, another Shabbat study without Ross. For now. Uh, for now. He's in Amman, Jordan this morning, and he'll be joining us. So we're, we're going to give you uh, this overview pretty quickly. I'm going to do a short introduction uh, to a video. Then we're going to play the video where Ross um, is being interviewed in um, Tamar um, uh, about... Uh, the um, Moses scroll. And this is really yeah. kind of what we're going to talk about today. Then after that, <clears throat> we're going to open the chat to asking uh, Ross, uh, you know, what questions and, and we'll bring up questions and issues. And also we want to hear from you what your thoughts are about the, yeah. about the issue. And now sure. I also want to say Shabbat Shalom. Yeah. And, and, and it's uh, interact more interactive today. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm just going to go um, give you a little introduction on, on, what and why and all this. And then we're going to play the video, which is like 22 minutes long. And, uh, and then we're going to have open questions and um, just remind everyone to be nice when they're asking questions. And we, we're inquisitive people. Um, we're, we're travelers through time and space. And we happen to stop on this earth for a little bit. So I get to the start of this. Why? <clears throat> um, why? Why do we care about the Moses scroll? Um, some people get upset when you talk about the canon the, of the Hebrew Bible, the Masoretic text, and just as Christians do about their um, Coda Sinaiticus and, and their, their whole New Testament and, and so forth. And I understand that. But um, from the exegesis that you start, and, and we started um, at a very young age, um, you learn uh, that um, there are inconsistencies. There are anachronisms. There's just different accounts. And knowing people, um, if four people saw a, an accident, there'd probably be three or four different, um, you know, exact views of what happened in the accident. And it's like my Jewish friends from New York will say, if there are two Jews in an elevator, there are at least three opinions. Um, and so uh, I say that in a loving way. You might notice that my hair has been cut <clears throat> uh, from last time, and I'm just going to quote uh, my fav one of my favorite authors, um, <clears throat> Leonard Cohen, your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof, her beauty and the moonlight overthrew her. She tied you to the kitchen chair. She broke your throne and she cut your hair. And from your lips, she drew the hallelujah. So that that's what happened. Guilty. About I six inches is gone. I, I feel I feel lighter. But I didn't tie him to the chair. Now, All right. So so anyway, so in this search for the truth, um, we, we, we want to start peeling the onion and you got to be careful when you peel the onion because what makes sense and what doesn't. And, you know, there's a lot of great scholars that have talked about this. So I want to say this, you know, I read the book of Jay a long time ago and, and it stunned me. Um, I would suggest you read the book of Jay. Um, and it's, it's, it's if the um, Jehovah version or the Yahweh, they sometimes say of, of the uh, Torah was written, here's what it would say. And 
and while I don't agree with everything that they've come up with and they disagree with each other because there's kind of a new version of the document hypothesis these days, especially in Europe. And I'm sure Dr. Tabor could really get into that discussion. Um, wh what's happened is um, th there's truth that comes out when you look at it. So who was modifying the book and why were they modifying the book? And as you know, the word Bible, like the French word for library, means a volume of books. It's not just a book. People call it the good book. It's the good library, really, is what it, what it really is, right? And like um, we were speaking, James was speaking last week, it's not the Ten Commandments. This the Ten Issues or the Ten um, Words. That's a lot more than Ten Commandments. So, um, uh, number one, I want to reiterate uh, to James, or to, uh, for, uh, James had spoken of this, and, and Ross speaks of this. I want to re reiterate it doesn't mean that we're um, attacking um, the authenticity and the, and the um, you know the, the the truth of that that what's been written. It's it's just been truth has been seen by a few different people. So um, we're looking for the deeper truths. And I'm going to give you a, a simple mathematical thing that you should have all learned um, in in school, and that is in set theory, right? So if the Moses scroll is um, if the Moses scroll is this amount of truth, a, a little circle, and our other truths are bigger than it, but they encompass that truth, that's cool. But if our bigger amount of truths are not consistent with the smaller amount of truth that we got from the Moses scroll, that could be um, a determination of what was wrong with it. Um, so it's is is it a is it a set that includes all the Moses scroll, or is it said that it only includes some of the Moses scroll? That's a big issue for me. And, um, and Jono Vandor, if he gets a chance to jump on today, they're in Amman, Jordan with Timothy. Um, it, it, it is, it is an, it's an issue that clarifies things. Um, so we were given brains. Um, another great talk that um, James Tabor gave was when, I think it was the last uh uh, or, or maybe the one before uh, annual conference when he when he talked about God made these little gods with free will, you know, and this is uh, really beautiful for for me to think about it. You know, God to be born, to be created is such a privilege and such a gift. And we're, we're made in the image of the of the creator. And the idea in this image is that we we don't have the processing power, but we have all of the same um, ways of thinking. And um, and when you put a couple billion of us together, we can make the internet, we can, um, you know, go to Mars, we can make electric cars like Elon Musk, we can make uh, iPhones like Steve Jobs, but that's building on the backs of many people. So so that's that's the thing is that, you know, we are given this brain and we need to use this brain to find out why we came on this earth. That's the big question. Why are we here? And some people like to make it simple. I'm here to serve God. Well, but there's more to it than that. We're being prepared as, as, as these Elohim that we are. We're of the family of the Benai Elohim. God didn't create a different species. He made one. And, um, and so that's why I'm really excited. And I feel it's a privilege to serve Jehovah in any way I can and to learn, um, even when the learning is tough. So uh, looking at this, it's extremely important that we take it seriously. And if and we're open-minded. If it's not um, a, a truth, then we want to get rid of it. But there are so many things that were overlooked. James started the ball rolling with, uh, um, uh, it was Shimon Gibson who was was understanding this. And then the ball got kicked over to Ross and then dropped to me and Patty and Joan Ovandor. And we've been doing all kinds of things, traveling around the world, researching this. And it's exciting. And so this is a this uh, Gnosis um, a, a part of um, Myth Vision, um, they did a great uh, interview, which I'm going to play for you for 22 minutes um, from Tamar. And this has done so well. And I don't think there's anyone in the world that could have given the responses that Ross Nichols gave. I'm going to tell you right now, this is brilliant on this one subject. I agree with you there. I mean, he, he is just, he was on top of it. And I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just honored that I get to work with people like Dr. Tabor and Ross and uh, Shimon Gibson and Jono Vandor and all the people we've worked with, um, with that, that we're researching these things. Anyways, I'm going to play this now. So 
I want to tell you all, we're going to come back afterwards. Ross will be with us. And we want to have a discussion about this because we don't want to just pontificate uh, to other um, little Elohims. We want to have Elohim to Elohim discussions. So anyways, uh, we're going to bring in Ross uh, interview right now and just sit back and enjoy. December and of 2019, I get this email from James. He said, we have to talk. There was an article in the Harvard Gazette. If the, the guy's name is Hanan Tigay, and he wrote a book called The Lost Book of Moses. And it was about a Shapira scroll. Tabor and I both order the book. We read the book. And what we find is that Tigay assessed the information and came away with a Shapira scroll was a forgery. Well, here was one question that was nagging. I said, what did the scroll say? I'm curious. So I, I began to pour over it and I found that the text from the manuscript could very well be an ancient manuscript of the Torah. They felt like the forger was copying from lapidary, from stone inscriptions. Here's what they knew. They had the Moabite Stella, the Mesha stone. They had that and they saw there are dots between words. They Salom inscriptions discovered in 1880. It had dots, but they had never seen it used on leather. So they said the forger is trying to play like he knows about ancient writing. Well, now we know Emmanuel Tov says that at Qumran, there are 13 manuscripts written in Paleo-Hebrew. Just like this. Yes, they, they are written in Paleo and they have the word divided. back to the Gnostic informant and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I'm with Ross Nichols, the Moses scroll. The Moses scroll, Neil. So this is, this is an interesting book. And um, a lot of people like to wonder about, you know, people's credentials when they write books about academic stuff, but there's also experience. Yeah. People who had that raw experience, they go to the, they go to the sites, hands on stuff. This is your guy for that. This guy's been, how many times have you been here in this? This is uh, trip 18. Yeah. 18, but I'm kicking up dust. But you've, been, you, you've had trips here that six months long. Yeah, I stay several months when I come. Usually if I come, I'm going to make the most of it. I'm going to try to stay three months, chase down whatever wild, crazy idea I'm looking at. Yeah. Lead tours like we're on together with right. you guys. And yeah. So that's part of it. Digging in the soil. That's what I really like to do. Right. So, I, you know, when I, when I see that, I, it's something I, I, I take that seriously. For people who are hands on and, and take that approach. We're, we're talking about this Mo, the Moses scroll, yep. and I just before we even start, I just want to let people know, we're going to get into the basics on this. If you want to know more about it, the link's in the description where you can buy the book, but we're also going to go a little bit deeper and, on Derek Lambert's Patreon page, Myth Vision Podcast Patreon. So there'll be two parts. I'll, I'll remind you guys at the end of this video. So tell us a, a quick little rundown about why you wrote this book. Okay, excellent question. Let me tell you. So I'm, I'm sort of one of those guys, like you said, I don't, I don't have a PhD. I started off like so many people just studying the Bible. I fell in love with the Bible, worked my way out of Christianity, worked my way out of fundamental Christianity. Years ago, I did a class called Following Jesus Out of Christianity, you know. So then I, I take the next logical step and I turn to the Hebrew Bible. Well, from a fundamentalist standpoint, Neil, I, I kind of wanted to remain somewhat fundamentalist, you know. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I believe that the 66 books of the Bible are inspired, inerrant, the holy, you know, all yeah. of that. I mean, that, that was my view. Uh, and then I began studying Hebrew very early, and I just pushed my way through the material. Well, as I moved into the Hebrew Bible, I carried some of that same fundamentalist approach. So now I'm looking at the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, and I felt like the real truth is here. But I took that same approach. Well, as I worked through it, I began to really delve into some of the academic works. I know you've worked through a lot of this material, too. But what I began to notice, primarily after years of teaching through the Torah cycle of readings, you know, the annual cycle of readings, that go back all the way to temple, Second Temple times, I began to notice some strange things. You know, I began to question whether or not the traditional view that Moses had written the Torah was really valid. Could it stand the test? You know, traditionally we say that Moses wrote the five books. You can't pick up a Bible without seeing the heading Genesis, the first book of Moses, Exodus, right. the second right. book of Moses. 
Well, as I began to read, I started noticing something, and I didn't know this level of detail, but let me tell you, 592 times Moses is mentioned in the Torah, from the time we meet him in Exodus 2 until Deuteronomy 34, 12. You take that section, you find Moses 592 times. Why would that trigger me? Because most people writing an account would not use the third person. Right. I started noticing things. Uh, you know, it describes Moses' death. Well, we know that, mo that dead people don't write. So this is not something I discovered. This is something that academics had discovered all through primarily 18th, 19th century up into Wellhausen and, you know, all of his work. So I began to question. I began to question whether or not Moses had written any of it. This led me to the discovery, and I'll tell it to you this way. I delivered a class that sort of unveiled this at a conference, a United Israel World Union conference in April of 2019, and this was the title, Finding the Hand of Moses in the Torah. Like the that. Torah like within our Torah. Now the approach is this, right? You can, you can sense, I know you're going to pick up on this, I still want to believe that Moses did write something, but what was it? Right. So I began to notice there are seven places, and we may get into this more deeply, but I'll tell you just the, the high end of it. I noticed seven things that the Pentateuch tells me that Moses wrote. But it's not from Moses' hand. It's from another author. Someone is telling me that Moses wrote something. Classic example. Deuteronomy 31, verse 9. Deuteronomy 31, verse 24 through 26 says, Moses wrote his Torah gave it to the priest, and the priest put it mitzad ha'aron, beside the ark. So think about that. Moses wrote the Torah, the author of Deuteronomy tells us, and then it says he put it beside the ark. Well, that's somebody telling me Moses wrote the Torah. It's not Moses saying, I wrote the right. Torah, right? You get the difference. Yeah, that's... So the thing that got me was, I said, wait a minute. We still have three chapters of Deuteronomy left, that, in other words, it can't be talking about Genesis 1 1 through Deuteronomy 34 12. So, Neil, I then said, I have to find that book. There's a fundamentalist in me. Is there any trace of that book? For instance, the Torah mentions the book of Jasher in the right. book of Numbers. I've always wondered about this. Right. Because so we have a Jasher, yeah, Jasher, but yeah. it's not the right one. Yeah, this you is can like go medieval. on Amazon and get right. it, but it's not the right. book. So we have references to these ancient books, these sources that the authors, whoever they were, of the Pentateuch and other books in the Tanakh, we have references to these sources, but we don't have the sources. So my question was, has this book been lost? Right. So I set out on a, a journey, and I discovered that within the book of Deuteronomy, there's a first-person element to Deuteronomy. It's only in Deuteronomy. Now, if you open up Deuteronomy, you read Deuteronomy 1, 1 through 5, and it's a narrator speaking. These are the words which Moses spoke on the other side of the Jordan between this place and that place, so forth and so on. And it's all third person. Guess who didn't write it? Moses. Moses. But, then, but then you begin seeing. Now, this is only Deuteronomy, Neil. You start seeing places where Mo, the, the writer, let's just be honest. I'm saying it's Moses. Some people would laugh at that. But, so, but here's the deal, it's in first person. So you get this feel where it says, and the Lord spoke unto me saying, well, he's talking first person. So that was what I was working on. Fast forward, I delivered that talk in April of 2019. Dr. James Tabor, good friend of mine, you guys know that we're good buddies. He writes me an email and he said, hey, December of 2019, I get this email from James, he said, we have to talk. There was an article in the Harvard Gazette, if I'm not mistaken, and it was about an author who had written a book. The, the guy's name is Hanan Tigay, and he wrote a book called The Lost Book of Moses, I believe is the title of his book. And it was about a Shapira scroll. So I read that we, Tabor and I both order the book, we read the book, and what we find is that Tigay assessed the information and came away with a uh, he confirmed the scholarly consensus. So up front, I'm going to tell you, Neil, that academics, both in the, at the time in the 19th century, all the way up through modern times, the majority of them say 
Shapira scroll was a forgery. Well, here was the one question that was nagging. I said, what did the scroll say? I'm curious. Right. Right? Because I hear you. You got all that. You say that you think it's a fake. Well, that's what they said. But what I want to look at the raw data. Yeah, I'm not an easy, you can't convince me easily. Give me the data. So I, I began to pour over it. And I found that the text from the manuscript. Now, if I can show you this. Show it right here. Yeah. This is a replica, obviously. And mm -hmm. it's not to scale. It's a little bit big. I bought it off eBay, bro. You, sure. can, you can get this off eBay. But this is one fragment. So the quick dirty of this is there were 16 strips of leather that were discovered in a cave in uh, 1878, according to the story by Bedouin. Now think about this, Neil. 1878, uh, actually it was discovered in 1865. Paleo, yeah, it's paleo. So it's discovered in 1865, but in 1878, Moses Shapira, a scroll merchant, like he's working as an agent for the British Museum, he comes in contact with the, the Bedouin comes to him and said, hey, you know, I got this scroll, you might be interested. So he buys the manuscript uh, for next to nothing and he sends the transcription. So you, you've studied paleo. Yeah. So he begins with paleo and he's transcribing it in modern Hebrew letters. As he does, now there are 16 strips. Now it represents two manuscript copies of what Shapira believed could very well be an ancient manuscript of the Torah. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So he takes this, sends it to a German scholar by the name of Schlotman. Schlotman looks at it and he says, he doesn't have this, he has the transcription. He writes him a scathing letter. He says, Shapira, this is a forgery. How could you dare suggest that something that doesn't agree with our authentic Bible is real? Really? And what, what made him think that? Because it didn't agree with the canonical text. Really? Yeah. The ten, by the way, this does have a version of the Ten Commandments, Neil, but it's not the version you know. Really? Now, that shouldn't have been a problem. Why? Because in the Bible, all the fundamentalists should know this, in the Bible the we have two word. accounts of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Words, as they're called in Hebrew, yeah. Aseret Devarim. Exodus 20. Deuteronomy you 5. You put those side by gonna, side, they don't agree. There's differences. There. Now, this is supposed so to be the words of God from Mount Horeb, from Mount Sinai. So, but Schlotman sends it back, sends back a letter, scathing Shapira and says, how dare you? So what ultimately happens with this is Shapira feels bad, you know, because he wants to be a good believer and he puts it in a gold safe at the Bergheim Bank. He leaves it there and guess what? It stays there for five years. Wow. But then he begins to think. He begins to hear about the academic critical assessment of the Torah. He comes across a book that was written in 1860 by a scholar uh, by the name of Friedrich Bleek. Friedrich Bleek wrote a book in German. Germans are the best academics on the Bible, right? <laughs> so particularly in the 19th century. 1860, the book was written. He gets a hold of it in about 1882. And he reads it and he comes away with this startling conclusion and it's somewhat the same as what came to me. And that's this, the Torah, as we have it, the Pentateuch, was not written by Moses or about his time. So Shapira then said, wait a minute, this might be authentic. So he goes back, he gets a scroll out of the bank and he says, that's it. I'm going back to the European scholars and I'm gonna show it to them again. Now he's convinced, Neil, he knows ancient scrolls. He knows old scrolls. Now here's the deal. This is 80 years. It was discovered 80 years before the Dead Sea Scrolls. Wow. So now Shapira brings it to Germany. And there's, so they yeah, don't even know ahead. that there's text that can survive that long. No, that's it. That's really important. That's the wow. point. Now get this. I'm going to tell you this piece. So in 1883, he's got the courage. He's got the conviction. He believes it's authentic. He doesn't care what they think. So he takes it to Germany, and by the way, he's got a couple of scholars, most people that, that come on now, the academics that still say it's fake, they don't know all the background. Well, I they're just kind of, they're just They're parroting what they learned in graduate school. to the consensus, school. right. It's right. absolutely. So now I'm, me, I'm, in, I'm into this subject. I downloaded every single thing that the PEF, Palestine Exploration Fund did. I downloaded every article from the Athenium, from all the British papers, 
And, and I read through the story and I recreate that in the book, but the fast version of it is this. He brings it to Leipzig, Germany. And in Leipzig, two young scholars by the name of Hermann Goethe and Edward Meyer, they look at this and they believe it's real. Nobody knows this. It's only in the German personal correspondence between these two. But he believes it's real, they believe it's real. He takes this manuscript, they, they transcribe it and they published it, and I actually read and used their transcription. Then it goes to England where David Christian Ginsburg, the great Masoretic scholar, he then transcribes it. So what I did, this is before I even decided for sure if I was gonna write a book, I pulled those two transcriptions into one text, making a critical text for the first time. And I worked through it and I provided a translation of it. And you know what I found? Get this, Neil. Remember when I told you I was looking for what did Moses write? Right. Seven things that the, the Pentateuch says Moses wrote guess what this document contains? Those things. Those things that Moses would have written. Wow. Now, I took that and I said, now I'm not, I'm not being silly here. You know, I, I'm not just saying, this is the scroll that Moses wrote, but I tell you what I do think. I think this gets us closer to the authentic, call it Ur Deuteronomy. You know, like, like the, the, first, the, the first Torah, if you will. Because, get this, it comes, it comes before all the priestly interpolations. If you would have, in the 19th century, if I were trying to create a fake, and I wanted to, let's say I looked at all the scholarly material and I said, you know, I'm going to fake them out. The one thing I would have put in it was chapter 12 through 26, all the priestly material. Because that's what a lot of scholars still believe that represents the, the earliest. Yeah. So that's what he would have done, but guess what's lacking in this? every bit of that. I mean, you're going to have to have me back. We're going to have to talk about the details of what's right. there, what's not there, and what does that really mean? Right. I yeah. mean, it, it's just amazing. Now, I want to get in more into deep and in why you think this is that text, Yeah. but I want to do that over on Derek's Patreon, and so people have to join the Patreon to get that. Or, yeah. your other option, get the book. Yeah, the book. I put, I put the book both. in the description. You do both. You get. You can really get thoroughly on this. But I think this is a good um, breakdown of what this is. And as you can see, the last thing I want to ask you. Then we'll, we'll, this is the last thing I want to end on. All right. What is it about this that they looked at and say, "Nah, this has got to be." Like, what are they look? What are they seeing that makes academics say this is a forgery? Yeah, you you hit on one of them. One of them is they honestly they just didn't know. I mean, if I were a scholar in 1883 and you told me, hey, Dr. Nichols, we found a scroll and I said, tell me about it. And they'd say, well, so the story is it was in a cave uh, kind of near the Dead Sea. And uh, and I'd say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It was near the Dead Sea. And, and you tell me that this is 2,000, 3,000 years old. There's no way. Almost without exception, the scholars of the day said, there's no way that a leather scroll could survive in a cave. But now we know that's, that's now not we true. Now we know, but listen, wow, it gets better. Kind of a couple more things. One that you'll hear all the time, it's repeated like people are zombies. They say it's non-provenance. Okay, makes sense. And the reason that these scholars say this, we don't want to encourage antiquities theft. We don't want somebody to say, hey, look, I got some antiquities, but I can't tell you where I got it. I mean, that's just bad business. And, right. it, and it encourages theft. So I get that. But here's the deal. They said it, there's no way it survived. It wouldn't have survived. Now, let me tell you a couple more details quickly yeah. that go with that. Number one, the leather, and, and I'm still working on some of this. This is a replica again. It's, it's a little bit bigger than it was, actually. Sure. But it was letter to letter, back to back. It was coated on the back with an asphalt type uh, coating. And, and so notice the asphalt's never going to touch the letters. This is the paleo writing, but it did over time bleed through. But we believe that it was done for the purpose of keeping it flexible. Now, whenever it was also, they found it, it had linen stuck to it. Now, when we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they had linen stuck to them. So this is they the had same. asphalt. And not only that, written in paleo. Before, Same thing, yeah. But before this, there was nothing ever found written on leather in paleo. I got the, this is, this is going to be a tough question right here. Yeah. Does any of the Dead Sea Scrolls have those dots? 
Yes. They do? Yes, they do. Wow. So you were so looking I just wanna, at I just, for, for anyone who has no idea what I'm talking about, in, the, in this text, there are these dots yeah. in between the words. Right. And a, a lot of ancient Hebrew doesn't do that. There, there are no dots Look, in between. Here, here you go. Here's right. an example. It, here, yeah. here, here. And so scholars saw that and said, that's later. Well, what they actually said, it's worse than that. They felt like the forger was copying from lapidary, from stone inscriptions. Here's what they knew. They had the Moabite Stella, the Mesha stone. They had that and they saw there are dots between words. They Siloam inscriptions discovered in 1880. It had dots, but they had never seen it used on leather. So they said the forger is trying to play like he knows about ancient writing. Right. Well, now we know, Emmanuel Tove says that at Qumran, there are 13 manuscripts written in Paleo-Hebrew. Just like this. Yes, they they are written in Paleo and they have the word divided. I'm not, I gotta say, this, I'm con the you're, forger this is wouldn't very know. convincing. He wouldn't this know. This is very convincing. He wouldn't know. We're gonna go deeper into this. Like I said, the link for the book is in the description, the Moses scroll, check it out. And if you also wanna continue this discussion, I'm going back to the bench and uh, Derek Lambert from Myth, Myth Vision Podcast has taken over and you can check out part two of this video on his Patreon. And I want you guys to shoot it down. Yeah. That's what that's I good. want. That's I don't good. want people to think, oh yeah, yeah, I believe it. Look at the evidence and see what you think. And you have just attained true gnosis. Wasn't that just amazing? That was just amazing. Now we're welcoming from Amon Jordan, Ross Nichols and Jonah Vendor, truth to you and uh, the Tanakh tour folks. We're really excited to have them. Um, and there's a lot of comments going on. Hopefully, Patty's going to help me read them. But um, first, we want to hear from the land of the Moses Scroll. Yeah. Ross and Jonah. So they're in Moab right now. Um, is that correct, Ross? <clears throat> yeah, man. Can you hear us? Yeah, we're, we're, we're hearing you. Hello? If everyone else can hear. Yeah. Hello. You hearing us? We're in Amman, Jordan. We're at the hotel. A nice crowd of people around. Some, you know, Timothy Thompson's with us. We just it's cutting to get out. everybody it's on here. here but yeah. I'll text you. And uh, of course, we have uh, you know, our, our very pages here. He's with us on the tour. And uh, I not, not have met John and Sarah and no, quite a few others. So we've got a Room full of uh, so welcome, welcome in a way. Oh, no. Staying Jordan, but John might not see that. You guys hear us okay? Okay. Yeah, it's uh, breaking up a little, Ross, but um, we we can we can hear you. Um, just a little crackling going on there. Um, I okay. apologize for that. Um, but um, the uh, the issue is, uh, I I wonder. If you um, took took off your video, or like if you stopped the video, would it be better? Anyways, I don't know. We talk yeah, now, Ross. Let's try, try that. Can you hear no, me? It's no, different. it's no different. It's no different. I'm sorry. Um, you can turn the video back on. Yeah, it's breaking up a little bit, but um, l there's um, there's a. Mm -hmm. Uh, James Tabor is saying maybe you could call in on your phone. Um, is there a call-in number to this? can call your phone number. Y yeah, you could call me. All right, let hey, me do Hang on, that. we're just... Uh, okay. Can I say something? Right? Yeah, go ahead, Patty. Okay, Patty so uh, while they're doing that, I just wanted to say that uh, Ross, uh, besides the Moses Scroll, he also published um, a report by Herman Gute, and um, I'm doing a little study in here um, on the authenticity of the scroll via Hermagute. And uh, one of the points that stood out to me, uh, it, uh, one of the points I'm going to be bringing out is on page six, uh, where Herman Gute says, but if only it were not from Moab, if it did not in fact originate from there, for a forger who demands belief for his product will pre presently rarely have it appear from Moab. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was strange that if he really was presenting this as a forgery, to have right. it come from Moab right. was one of the po main points in this book that stood out to me. Yeah. But um, anyway, um, go ahead, Ross and Jono. You're going to call us, Ross? 
or Jono could call me. Hang in there, everyone. Hang in there, everybody. Here's here's another issue. You don't realize how much of the Bible happened east of the Jordan. Here we go. We got Ross here. You there, Ross? Yeah, I'm going to crank it up here. There we go. Keep okay. Yeah. Now let me make sure I don't cause a loop here. Yeah. I'm going to have to step out. We're trying to do something kind of crazy here. Yeah, that's okay. So, uh, yeah, so first of all, thanks for everyone's patience. I have actually our tour group is listening in, so they're really getting a bad deal because uh, I keep taking the phone from them and the Internet's not so great in the lobby. <laughs> But anyway, so hopefully the sound is good now. You can hear me okay? Yeah, I think everyone yeah, can. Yeah, sounds great. James, uh, can you can okay. you give us a lot better, says Kim. All right. So so uh, yeah. so the issue is uh, is as follows. Um, you're very close to where the actual scroll was found um, and, and originally. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So so that's a yeah. big that's a big deal that that um, you know. Um, Dr. Tabor has talked to us about doing some excavations or at least some surveys. I think you start off with a survey. And um, yep. Daniel Wright in his great English well, says me, it's gooder. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you this. One thing that's really important, uh, because Dave, you, Patty, Chono, and I, when we came in the summer and sort of scouted some things out, a lot of that, as some of the listeners and viewers may not know, was really for partly at least uh, for this tour. Right. Because what we're now able to do is we're able to direct the tour guide and the driver to bring us to places off the beaten track that are associated with the Moses scroll. Yes. So, for instance, if you recall when, when we were riding in the car, you guys rented the car, we're driving down the road. And we're following the outside on the King's Highway. Now, I'll have to send them the maps when I get home and get settled after Thanksgiving. But, but we realized that the road we needed to take to come out at the right place where the scroll was discovered, now, because of that trial and error that we had, we're going to, Jono and I will be able to take the tour group directly to the place. And uh, so a lot of the things that we did on our our kind of our scouting expedition we're able to put into place. And a lot of this tour is going to focus on the Moses scroll. Partly we did some on the Israel tour and partly we're going to do some more, obviously, on the George tour. So now I can't see the questions that people ask. So you guys can uh, help me out. I'm standing outside in Amman, Jordan. Uh, standing out by the street so I get a better signal. So, All right. We're, Patty's going to be looking them up. Um, and anyone can kind of re, re put out your questions or concerns now. Disagree, agree. Um, uh, the, the, one of the issues is um, uh, I want to know um, if, if we would maybe do a Shapira tour down the road would be a, a great one, uh, not only for what happened in Jerusalem, right. Um, but, uh, but what would happen in Jordan? Because, um, there's some excavation that has to go on there. There's no doubt. And people, yeah. uh, don't realize yeah. when, the, until they yeah. read the, uh, uh, Bible and, and understand, <clears throat> um, the, you know, the locations, um, there's a lot of clues in the, in the Torah, uh, about what happened, um, uh, East of the Jordan and, and everyone thinks yeah, it's all right. And so I think that's an important part of what we're doing here. And, and the other issue um, is uh, that I wanted to bring up is, um, you know, Ross, we, we've both been in the Berlin Library and the Palestine Exploration Fund, and, and we've been searching all over for this. People don't know that, but we've actually gone out there. And I think um, to, to look at um, the evidence that surrounds the initial thoughts uh, is quite um, amazing to me um, about what they, yeah. uh, what the the people who actually saw the scroll and read it thought, and and then of course this kind right. of uh, um, political, I call it almost a political type of response. And so facts don't matter. It's just you keep you keep saying this is a fake, and everyone eventually says, well, that was a fake. Okay. Well, James says here, James. Well, I, oops, go ahead. Yeah. 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, uh, James uh, Tabor. You go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, you're, you're okay. Ready. James Tabor uh, writes in. He says, Ross refuted effectively that Shapira was not faking his scroll following the German scholarship of his time. But what if he wrote a scroll to reflect a kind of... Where's the rest of it? I don't see it. James. A, ki uh, a kind of every... Okay. Everything there fits what Jesus taught. Yeah. Yes, I agree with that, too. Yeah. I, I often wondered if Jesus read from the uh, from the Moses scroll as his emphasis was on um, loving your neighbor, loving your brother, and, yeah. and things like that, which yeah. was uh, brought out in the Moses scroll. Yeah. Another thing. Uh, Ross, you still there? Well, I mean Ross, you still yeah, there? Yeah, I'm, okay, I'm so, yeah. Okay, uh, so JJ yeah. JJ Sillery says, "How important is it to find the actual leather strips?" <laughs> okay, that's a that's a great question, and the first thing that I would say to address that is, people will often say, "Well, Ross, you guys don't even have the scroll." So the first thing I would say to that is. It, it's not an accurate uh, response, really, to say we don't have the scroll. What we don't have is the physical scroll, but we do have the text. And here's something that's very important. This is point. What we have is we have two independent, actually now we have three independent transcriptions, uh, one by Shapira that Idan Dershowitz discovered in the Berlin Library, we have uh, the transcription that was published by Herman Guta, which we have since republished. And then we have David Christian Ginsburg's transcription. Now, the first thing you have to do to, is to establish the tech. So while we don't have the physical scroll, we do have the text of the scroll. Now, someone may say, well, that's nothing. Well, if you think about it, uh, when we look at our Bibles, when we look at the, the Bibles that we carry around, the earliest manuscript that we have, particularly before the Dead Sea Scrolls, let me put it this way, the earliest complete Hebrew Bible that we have dates to about a thousand of the common yeah, era. Yeah, it's yeah, not ancient. That That's the earliest complete manuscript, the Leningrad Codex. <clears throat> now, we do have Dead Sea Scrolls of portions of all of those texts, except Esther, and that's even debatable. But the first thing I would say is we do have the text. And so what what's so amazing about the text is that when you look at the text, it tends to match letter by letter, word by word, what one would expect to find in the manuscript that Moses wrote. So I, I guess the answer to the question is how important is it to find the scroll I think it's really important for the people who would say that there's no way it's authentic because I would say when, because we're working so hard on this, when we discover the manuscript itself, the scroll itself, uh, then we'll be able to do proper scientific testing on it. Uh, and, and, and we'll be able to read the scroll with all the, the advanced technology that we now have in photographic means and so forth. So we are definitely looking for it, but until we find the physical scroll, we do have plenty to go oh, on, and that is Let's we have a fairly it. complete text of the scroll. Oh, Hopefully that answers the question. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we, we have uh, James upset here. He skipped uh -huh. my question entirely. I totally missed his point. Yeah. So uh, let so me James read what he said. Shapira was a Christian, so he faked a Torah that would reflect what Jesus taught. Um, I didn't know you had a question though, James. Um, you, you made a, a state. You made a statement, but he said you skipped his question. Oh. Was there a question you had, James, or did I miss that? Is he on? So there is. There is a theory. There is a theory, and several have put forth this theory, and that is that because Shapira was uh, a Jewish Christian, he was Jewish by birth, born in Kamenetz, the Dulles, made Aliyah, moved to the land, and along the way, he converted to Christianity in Budapest. And mm -hmm. and so when when he arrived in the land, honey, he became a member around. of Christ's church, the Anglican community right. in Jerusalem. Right. So some have proposed, and it's primarily, I would say, a misunderstanding, and this is, this is my theory, uh, because they see that the ten words in this manuscript, the Ten Commandments, the tenth is different than what we have in the canonical text. And the tenth one is, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. 
So some have suggested, there are a couple of scholars who put forward this, uh, this idea that he faked it and that he wanted to be more Christian than the Torah that we have in the Pentateuch. And they base that off of that idea. But what they generally do is they don't quote the actual 10th word, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. They say it because a lot of times you'll read their quotes and they'll say, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So they try to base this idea that it's a Christian text. But one thing I like to remind people of is that both you shall uh, love your neighbor as yourself and you shall not hate your brother in your heart. Both of those sayings are not Christian in their origin. They both come, as we all know, from Leviticus 19. So I've effectively, I think, argued that that does not have to be the case on my academia page. I countered a couple of the articles that were out there. Um, but it, So I don't think it's a Christian text at all. I think it is a very thoroughly Hebraic text what it is lacking, though, is all of the priestly material. So we don't have any of the material that is typically considered uh, Levitical or priestly material. And I think that's quite incredible because that is the material that's challenged by the prophets later in the Hebrew Bible. Everything from sacrifice, there's no sacrificial element to this document, um, and and most of the other priestly material as well. Did, did, did James have a question? Was yeah, yeah no, I think up? you answered it. Uh, James said it's a much broader argument, not just that verse, also the great commandment, no sacrifice and so forth. Um, so um, yeah. they, they argue that it um, removes all the Jewish ritual um, commands, just ethics. So... Um, yeah, uh, that that yeah. that's getting back peeling that onion to to um. So you know, I've always spoken to this in my talks. One of the things there's a difference between religion and faith, and religion yeah. tends to be more man-made, um, and they tell us you know how to pray, and they they tell us all all these, they take the commandments and they you know pontificate on them, and the issue is um the the issue is that, um, faith is different than that. And um, some people just blindly follow the religion without trying to interact. And, 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 and faith is something that's very dynamic. It's organic. It's, it's living. It's something that's living. And, and that's a difference. And I, you know, the, that's just my view. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that, that is, um, it, 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 that's a bigger issue. And the point at the end of the day is, uh, f for me is that we want to strip away as much um, as much as we can, um, you know, in terms of uh, um, of the man-made stuff and get to back to what God didn't require a lot of us. He really didn't. And, and, and people have made yeah. this religion, the religion part of it so, so much more um, than uh, what, what the, the facts are. I'm um, back to James point. Um, I think, though, if uh, Moses Shapira was so dishonest as to fake a scroll for the purpose of making money, I believe that he would have copied the Ten Commandments verbatim. Uh, I don't think um, it, he had a theological agenda. Uh, is that usually a yeah. cause for forgery? I, uh, forgery is usually to make money. Yeah. Uh, that's just my opinion, though. No. Yeah, there well, there certainly, there certainly is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of things in the manuscript that if someone were forging it, they simply wouldn't have done. There, there are certain elements in the text right. that you would think, well, why would they, why would they change that? Why would it say, sure. uh, uh, Zamzamim instead of Zamzamim? Why would it, why would you change some of those kind of things? But yeah, I, I wanted to just, thing that I I think is, yeah, go ahead. I just want to say one thing. You brought this up, and I, I think this is something that when all these people who claim and jumping down that this is a forgery, ask them what the Bible says, and then ask them what the Moses scroll says. And they don't know the content. Right. And that's where it's that's where gotta watch my language here. That's where they're wrong. Uh, this valve isn't made yeah. correctly. Well, wait a minute. What is it saying? And how could have how could have uh, he made up this this 
content that corrects so many things as Jonah Vandor said. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we plan to do over the week as we're traveling around to these locations. No, no. Uh, first of all, I want to say, I, I should have said it earlier, but Dave and Patty, I really appreciate the fact that you covered for me and that Dr. Tabor has covered a class for me. And it's not that I don't love to teach or that I, that I, I want to take a break. I'm not at all taking a break. Uh, in fact, when I get back, I've already announced that I'm going to be starting a series on the prophet Jeremiah. Oof. We're going to be working through that entire book, and we're going to begin at the beginning. And, and so yep. if you think about it, the thing that I'm really excited about is that the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah as a prophet, is in the time when the scroll was discovered in the days of Josiah. And so all of these things tie together. And, and we can't forget that Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 8.8 8, that who are we to say that we are wise and the Torah of Jehovah is with us when the lying pen of the scribes has made it a lie. And right. what would make the prophet Jeremiah say that the Torah has been made a lie. And he, he's, clear the, he's clearly communicating that he must have seen something which suggests that that was the case. Now, a lot of people try to avoid this verse, but right before this, in Jeremiah 7, he basically, he clearly says that, uh, that the prophets, uh, that in Jeremiah 7, that God never commanded sacrifices. You sent James so mm -hmm. well, what do we do with all of this? But well, we know that he was there when the scroll was discovered. He was a prophet. Mm -hmm. He says in Jeremiah 15, when your words were found, I ate them. Now, I would associate that with the discovery in the days of Josiah in the temple. Right. So we have a lot to, to discuss on this matter. And, uh, I think that there are a lot of very important theories that are going around. Back to the first question of how important is it to find the actual manuscript. In the sense of really determining, yay or nay, oh, that would guys, settle it for sure. Mm -hmm. Because if it were discovered, we could get it tested and, and settle it for once and for all. But as I've often said, if they discover, let's say that Dave, Patty, uh, James, Jonah, and I, whoever else is involved, let's say that we do find the scroll and we test it and the DNA, you know, we, we test it, everything comes back and they say, look, this is from a goat that was born in 1881. Well, if that were the case, and I don't think it is, but let's right. say it is, right. then this is the most brilliantly pulled off thing that has ever been pulled over. Because there's no mm -hmm. way that the things that we know about the scroll could have been fake. Yes. They didn't know. And yeah. James covered this in his bar article, and we've talked about it. Uh, I just really recommend that people read the book so that they okay, can understand yes. the full argument. Uh, okay, I, I mean, I, I, and it's not just that I'm trying to get people to get the book. I really want them to right. read it because I think it's an incredible story. Okay, um, John Langberg says the original scroll of Moses is probably still beside the ark. Good hunting, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. 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 No, well, I, I, you know, there is a theory, and, and, and uh, John knows that the last sighting of the ark mentioned is, is something that we talked about, is from the book of Maccabees. Here it is. And the last mm -hmm. known sighting was over on this side of the Jordan where we are right now. So, yeah. Tell John we're gonna we're gonna maybe find it. Yeah. Who knows? Well, <laughs> and I think it's Wouldn't been. Be uh, I I think it's like, you know, um, like the book of Daniel. You know, close the book up until the time of the end, and and I I I'm not one of these conspiracy theorists, and I know everyone thinks they're born in the end times, but damn, things have certainly gone down the wrong way uh, for the world with with uh, everything. You know you. You're given all this knowledge like God's, but you don't have the morals to, um, you know, use it correctly. And I think that's what the 10 yep. words give us is those morals. Here, we got Dr. Tabor. I'm sorry we didn't have him before. There's James. And um, just want to say hello, James, and welcome. Hey, I can't see much. I'm just kind of on a phone. 
Yeah, I'm down in the corner, I guess, right? There you go. You want to be bigger? We'll make no, I want to just be with you. Side yeah. by side. <laughs> Can you see it better now? It doesn't matter. It's just what everybody else is seeing. I, I'm probably behind on the on my I stopped my laptop because it's um, echoing. But yeah. can Ross hear me? Um, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you, James. Yeah, I just wanted to add on this forgery argument uh, and what Patty said, too. If you ask the motivation of a forger, which is what all everyone starts with when they're trying to analyze the question. And money, of course, is the end game. Uh, almost all forgers want to sell what they forge and make money. I think, I mean, that's a bottom line. They don't do it to sit it you know, make forge something, put it on their mantle and say, oh, isn't that pretty? I forged it. They want to sell it. So the second question is you ask, well, if I'm going to for now forget Shapiro, whether he's of good character, bad character, I'm just talking generically. So I'm a guy that wants to forge th this scroll, whether I'm Shapiro or not. OK, what am I going to put in it? What is the content? And as you rightly said, Ross, he had read the 19th century scholar Bleak, and if he went by that, he would have said, I want to fool the scholars. I'm going to put in the rituals and the sacrifices and all the stuff that's in the middle of Deuteronomy 10 through 17. And he didn't. So yeah. I think you have a really strong argument there that, no, he did not try to just reflect a uh, critical scholarship of his day. And now we look at it over a hundred years later and we go, ah, see, that's what he did. And yet that's not what's in it. So that's strong. Mm -hmm. The second uh, possibility yeah. that Clawens, Professor Clawens has suggested, <clears throat> and I believe uh, there was another, do you remember the other scholar? Um, was it Tyker? I think Tyke, Teichner. Tyker. Tyker. Yeah. He also suggested it before. And I think it's, Maybe it's the one that I am working on to refute, not just because I want to refute it, because I think it's incorrect, but it's a pretty strong argument. It would be, uh, I want to show the world that Moses w taught something very close to Christianity in the generic sense. I don't mean yeah, the yeah, Trinity yeah. or the Apostles' no. Creed, but the idea of what would be in the Hebrew Bible. So love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. Sacrifices aren't necessary. What are the blessings and curses? All the basic ethics that, you know, Christianity would say still remain. No rituals of the law. In other words, it would be a sort of yeah. Judaism as an encrusted temporary covenant. And now we've got, you know, the true heart and soul of the Torah. It would fit Paul's idea that, God gave the Torah and then added to it. It's what the Adventists argue. And then he added to it because of their transgressions. You know that argument, that all the rituals were added later. So uh, that, would, that would be the idea. And then he takes it to scholars that are Christian primarily, even though about half of them are converted Jews. And he hopes that they'll fall for it and say, oh, my God. Moses originally taught just the same stuff that we believe and that the church teaches. So it would be almost like an anti-Semitic thing, you see. So Judaism is this encrusted fossil with all these rituals and, you know, legalistic stuff. But the pure law of Moses is just so wonderful. So that's the argument. Now, the irony of that is what if the pure law of Moses was like this, right? You can just turn it back the other way. What if it was based on the words that Moses said in the first person in the Torah? And that's been your argument. So I just wanted to go over that because you're going to hear it a lot. I think it's where most of the scholars are going who aren't still arguing about the paleography of the, you know, pre-exilic Hebrew. I mean, that's going to go on with the epigraphers on a very technical level. But yeah. other scholars are beginning to say, you know, why are you so impressed with this? He's a Christian. He just wrote what he imagined 
Moses would say to agree with the Christians, but then with the work you're doing, and also Rolston, remember Rolston, the great skeptic, in his article on thetorah.com, look it up, what did Moses write? It looks like you and he are sailing in the same waters, maybe like uh, Edon Dershowitz didn't know what you were doing, you didn't know what he was doing. You. You know, yeah. you you express your ideas in your book about the original scroll based on the text. So I actually think it be, can become the strongest argument rather than the weakest. I don't know if that's clear to everybody what I'm saying, but I, think um, I get what you're saying. Yeah. But um, most stories, I think. If, if that was his intention, it would have had some kind of crucified Messiah or. Well, I don't think for they would say Moses Moses wouldn't have done that because then it would be obviously a fake. Like right. when you look at pseudepigrapha, all our pseudepigrapha, these are the books, you know, that you know, like Jubilees and yeah. between uh, Second Esdras and so yeah. forth. They have okay. Christian interpolations mm -hmm. in them, even though they're Hebrew texts. <laughs> text. So yeah. you know how you can tell them? They're like really stupid interpolations. Like it'll go along and it'll be authentic and it'll say, mm -hmm. and then my son, the Lord will come and be born of a virgin. And you go, oh yeah, I'm sure somebody wrote that, you know, in right. the Hebrew Bible. So I think he would be smart enough not to put anything blatant. Right. I'm I trying agree. to give you the argument that Collins would make. And, and Collins is a good scholar, but I think the best way to refute it is exactly what Rolston has done and what Ross has done, what is the Torah that Moses wrote? Ask that before you even look at the scroll. And then if it corresponds to that, you're arguing internally and tightly on the basis of two texts that we have, the Masoretic text and this text, mm -hmm. and pulling out of the Masoretic yeah. text what Moses might have written and then reading an account of what he wrote and you go, wow, these are really similar. Now that argument has not been addressed by the the opponents at yeah. all. It, it's just been left in the dust. So I know they don't probably listen to this show, but I think we can go on YouTube and you can go on Derek's uh, yeah. program and other places and make make that real strong. We could even go on together if you wanted. Okay, then, can I ask a question from yeah, the audience sure. or much more? Okay, uh, this is going to take the conversation in a totally different direction. Okay, and I can leave. I just wanted to. No, get we that want one. you to stay. We want you to stay. Um, okay. Okay, Kimberly Wesley says, "Do you have any clue where the scroll is?" <laughs> and, yeah, that's a good question. And I think Ross knows about the yeah. uh, last place it was seen and our visit to England and. If you want to... Yeah, so so I can I can uh, answer it in a very broad way, and I think that's the way we would want to answer it at this point, mainly because of sensitivities. Understand that uh, that we have a small group, a small dedicated group that are really working hard, and so what I would say uh, publicly is this: the first thing we have to do is identify. You know, it's like if you lose your keys. Uh, you misplace something. What do people always say? They say, where, where did you see them last? So the first thing we're doing is we're trying to isolate the last place that the scroll was seen. And we know that. And it's not because of our research. We actually benefited from research that others had done, dead ends that they reached. And so the first thing I would say is that uh, there were 16 strips, 16 pieces making up 42 columns of text, which represented two manuscript copies. So of the 16 pieces, we know that...
asking, but I promise you that this group, United Israel, will be the first to know should we be very productive and, and produce some results. I would definitely let our group know before anybody else. Uh, but that's that's where we're at. We're we're primarily in Europe. And uh, and we're going to be making more trips as we can over the next year, hopefully, because because we do have some good leads, and and part of that is uh, just following up. We just don't want to go to Europe uh, and just run around the countryside looking. We want to narrow it down with with research first. As soon as we feel really confident that our leads are secure, then we'll take off on the airplane. So. Um, Hopefully, even though I was I was a little bit evasive, that's about yeah, no, all. Yeah, no, no, right we now, can't I give think. away everything. Ross, um, now didn't someone maybe it was Daniel Wright uh, also suggest there might be other copies of the scroll um, in other different areas, maybe caves that we need to explore? Yeah, I'll I'll say one thing on that. We actually have Barry Page on our trip with us, and many of you in United Israel know Barry. Uh, Barry is here uh, partly because we're good friends, but the other reason he's going to be very helpful in the search, uh, particularly while we're here and his theory and Daniel Wright has proposed this as well, that, uh, what you, one consideration, this is just an idea. We have two copies that were discovered at a certain location in the Wadi Mujib in, uh, the land of Jordan. Well, if it turns out, if you look at a map, and of course, I know I haven't sent the maps yet. I promise to do so when I get back. But uh, you look at the tribal territories. Now, that there were Levitical cities that were both east and west of the Jordan Rift, both in Transjordan and in the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. And so one idea is that when the scroll was found, uh, even before possibly that copies of the original Moses scroll, the one that Moses wrote, because I don't claim that that the Moses scroll or the valediction of Moses, as Egon Dershowitz calls it, is the scroll that Moses wrote, but rather reflects two copies of that scroll. And so what if the, the guys are right, like Daniel Wright and Barry Page, and that is that these were two of the priestly copies that, that were found in the near the Wadi Muji, but they belonged to, say, a Levitical city uh, that was in the tribe of Reuben. And so that's an interesting proposal. Perhaps somewhere else in the country or in the land of Israel or the land of Jordan, other copies would be found. Uh, so I think that's that's the main point on that. Does that answer it? Yeah, I think it does. And um, I'm going to go back and cap capture a few of these issues. Um, one of them is um, that, um, that that it's Phil Neal said it's much easier or safer to call it a fake, uh, which I think is a very good truth. In other words, oh, no, that couldn't that's be right. real. That That's a big deal. And then um, uh, Dana Adams said, the Torah of Moses is part and parcel of the Elijah prophecy and Malachi. I'm just bringing up comments that people had, had brought up. Another one is Kermit. Kermit, okay. um, the, we, we have one of, uh, here. He says, doesn't linguistic analysis play a role in dating a text? If the script be defined as Paleo-Hebrew, doesn't that imply or give an indication of when it was written? So so that's something that, yeah, um, that we all could talk about there that's pretty imp impressive yeah there is, a couple, is james i don't have the video so is james still with us as well yeah he's here yeah, yeah, Dr. Here. Tate. okay I'm, good here. yeah so i was just gonna say on the paleography one of the biggest arguments that is uh that circulated when particularly when he don's book came out most people didn't even know about the book that uh the moses scroll what got the world's attention was he Don Dershowitz's book, The Valediction of Moses, a proto, uh, what was the exact title? Uh, a proto biblical book. And he Don argues in favor of an early dating. In fact, from his perspective, he dates the manuscript at 957 BCE based on some paleographical evidence as well as 
some of the linguistic characteristics uh, of the manuscript. And he, he, with another scholar by, by the name of Naama Patel out of Texas, they wrote a really challenging piece. And to date, the arguments that they put forth in their book have not been countered. They haven't even really been touched. Now, what, what happens with the paleography is one point I'll bring up. There's a scholar by the name of Benjamin Sass. Uh, he's in Israel. He's an Israeli. He's a professor, and his field is paleography. He argues that there is a particular yod, the Hebrew letter yod, and the form that is represented in a drawing that was produced in uh 1883 when he saw that he said this is absolutely authentic and the reason he could say that based on one letter was because this particular manuscript uh, this particular character form was not known until the 20th century when a certain ostraca was found that had that yod and it's it's got a flourish on it it's like a a fancy tick mark on the yod now the people who are arguing against the paleography are are bringing up their arguments and they're saying well this can't be real and they offer their reasons but but because benjamin sauce has put this out there i think that's a very strong case you know how do you make a yod a certain way that has not been seen and it, it wasn't seen in that day and again it wasn't seen until 19 if i'm not mistaken it was in the 1970s even so so there are some pretty good arguments uh for the paleography now what he done puts forward in his book and this would be my last statement on this it's certainly out of my field but one of the things that uh that Don says is the people who are arguing against the paleography, here's what they say. They look at the letters. Now, remember, we don't have any photographs. All we have are artistic representations of the text and the charts that the transcribers made. And what the, the people who argue against it say that the stance of the letters is wrong. In other words, you, the letter should, I'm making this up, a letter should lean more to the left, yeah, yeah. and this is more straight up and down. But what what uh, Edan Dershowitz says is, is that that's not a good argument against it, because first of all, you're not looking at the manuscript, you're looking at someone's representation of it. Of course, good point. this is the end of it. Of co course, the opposite of that, someone says, well... How do you then say that the yod is indicating an earlier date when that also is a representation of someone in the day, see? So it goes back and forth on that. And I think that, first of all, from a paleographic standpoint, if you can't condemn it, then you can't uh, condone it. In other words, you can't say right. it's real based yeah. on the paleographical, nor can you say it's not. But what's the most powerful indicator to me that it represents a very early strata of the text is what it says. Uh, and I think that it goes, it, it's so primitive and so simple and straightforward, it seems to me to predate Judaism in all its forms and Christianity certainly in all its forms. And it just, uh, only now are we discovering that uh, what scholars now have identified as the latest tier of the Torah. Right. It doesn't have any of that. I mean, that's powerful. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, Dr. Tabor is going to speak. I think at the end of the day, um, you have to know what the Bible says and it's intense and we're given brains and the exegesis that we come up with over these years helps us to clear those, those layers away. Dr. Tabor. Yeah, I was just going to add to the, the epigraph, really what Ross said, uh, Dershowitz's uh, full book and his <laughs> summary article, if you go to it's free, it, it's a scholarly book that would cost over $200, and you can download it. So go to academia.edu and just type in E, just spell it like it sounds the name Dershowitz, and you'll get his page, 
there at the first, you'll see it. You can read the book and the article that was published in the journal, but it's in English. That'll give you the summary. Now, one of the things that does deal with the epigraphy, but like Ross said, since we don't have the photographs, we're not so these epigraphal arguments come down to, to things like in that, in what, what were grammatical constructions and things like that. Not so much, but to me, what the really convincing work is of Idan in, in terms of the scroll is, is that it appears to re reflect from the pre-exilic period that is solid and that we have in the Hebrew. He looks at Micah. He looks at Hosea. He looks at Haggai. He looks at Isaiah. And he finds that there are indications expressed, especially listing of the commandments. You know, when the prophet ate, steal, commit adultery, how did they come up? You know, what order are they using to look at it? You, many of you probably have never gotten into this. But even his technical, but those arguments are clear. And they're they're kind of what does he call them? Yeah. Precursors of I forget what he called them. He has a word for it, for it I, I think better than I would. But when when you have these texts of the prophet and the, the other thing is lots of insights in more modern critical even discovered. And I think you say this in your interview with Derek also, because I'm a Patreon member. Uh, lots of things in the Hebrew Bible heard yet by critical scholars. The Moses scroll already has them in it. And, and what he, what was he in 1878? A prophet? And he could tell where critical scholars are 2022? That's, that's a kind of point. a stretch. Yeah, yeah that's any yeah. of oh, that, you know. I want to say before we go on, um, we're trying to address all of the viewers' questions, and we don't mean to overlook you. The the news, the, the chat feed keeps moving along. So if there's a question that you asked and we missed it, um, don't be afraid to, to repost it again. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, guys. And, and well, let me add this to that, Patty. I know that people have a lot of questions. Uh, I'm happy to field questions, too, and all of us could. Uh, they can email me, and one, one of the things that Jonah and I have tried to do is to, to go live with several classes about the contents of the scrolls. So it would be very beneficial for us as well. If they have questions, we can incorporate those into our live streams, and we can talk about those questions. And, and of course, we could always bring in you guys or James or other experts that have looked at this deeply as well. So... Um, Rock, this, this, what, this, tell this, them uh, uh, what yeah, what night of the and, and how they can find it. Is, is it on Truth to You? Basically, can yeah, you start? Yeah, well, we're gonna we're we're doing it on Thursday nights now. Since we've been gone, we haven't had time. But when we get back, we're gonna pick that back up on Thursday night uh, at eight p.m. Central. Uh, every Thursday night, we're going to go live, and we're primarily talking about the Moses Scroll and or some of these, some people call it critical biblical studies, but I would call it analytical biblical studies. Back to Rolston, he used that term one in one of his recent articles, and I really like it because I think, I think when people, particularly people of faith, hear critical studies— the word mm -hmm. tends to be taken in a negative sense, and we're not being negative. We're, as, as we've often pointed out, we're actually depending on the text. Like if someone says, well, the Torah is as we have it, the Pentateuch is, there are no mistakes, Moses wrote it. Well, we're relying on the text for what we believe and not relying on what uh, tradition has said in those answers, though. So, so anyway, yeah, I think if people would email me uh, and or Jono, my, my email address is rosskaynichols at me.com, and you can send in questions. 
And when we go live on Thursday nights, we'll go live on my YouTube channel as well as uh, United Israel and so forth. So it's not going to be hard to find, and we're going to advertise it uh, widely as soon as we get everything set back up when we get back. Okay, well, um, I think we can kind of wrap it up here. It's been an hour and 20 minutes we've been live. And um, I really appreciate uh, Dr. Tabor coming on and certainly Ross and, and Jono coming in from over in uh, Mon Jordan. Um, it's, it's been great. And Thursday nights at 8 Central, 9 Eastern time U.S. Uh, it's a great thing um, to, for you to listen into these guys. And we uh, also pray for uh, – Ross's safe return and, and Toby and Jono. So we, and Timothy, we want to see y'all back here, James. Hey, look, I, I really miss y'all. Let me, let me add one other thing and then we'll let James let us uh, tell us something too. I wanted to say, uh, we we do plan to go live in Jordan while we're out on the road. So, so we realized that some of our touring that you'll be asleep, but you'll see the videos later. But for instance, we're, we're going to go to the museum in Amman. Uh, we're going to see the Copper Scroll. We're going to see uh, Jerash. We're going to see quite a bit. But as we work our way down, uh, we're going to see quite a few biblical sites. We're going to go to the River Jabok, where Jacob, according to Genesis, wrestles with the angel. Um, we're going to go to the Wadi Rum. We're going to spend two nights in a... Uh, sort of a Bedouin experience in tents. And uh, James told me he did that on one of the tours that he led over here. He said it's fantastic. Um, we're going to certainly be spending some time at the Wadi Mujib and uh, talking a lot about the Moses Scroll. But we're going to see biblical sites all along. So that's our goal is to go live here and there, and then people can watch the videos when they get up. So. Good. Awesome. I can't wait to see that. Um, Dr. Tabor had some more thoughts. No, I, All right. Uh, tell them what I say. Write down what I say. You ready? Yep. This is what I tell my students first day of class. Write this down on top of your notes. Critical means careful. Okay. Write yeah. that down, I tell them. Careful. Yeah. It, don't be sloppy. Second, don't claim for a text that claim for itself. So let's say, say books. Yeah. I work on the New Testament. Fired. God dictated it. Well, Luke 1, the author says, look, I searched, I checked. It seemed good to me. This is the best account I can put together. Same things with the Torah. Yeah. So don't, we, we should never claim for a something that it doesn't claim for itself that's not right. being a fundamentalist yeah. of the idea so those two points i think can help us a lot you're being critical with the bible and you're taking it all apart no we're being careful with the really says huge right. that's great yeah and crit wow. critical thinking versus feeling, I think, is yeah. important, too, because we yeah. all have feelings. Right. Uh, well, Max. I just want to say, wow. yeah, I want to say Shabbat Shalom and then please enjoy this Sabbath. And and I hope you all have enjoyed uh, watching this. Um, and again, we're just critical thinkers here. We're trying to understand and carefully take apart what was really given to us and trying to find that. And it's a lifelong search. It's not something you're going to find and say, Eureka. Anyways, uh, love you guys for, hey, for um, asking in. Go ahead, look, Ross. One, one more. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, Dave. I just wanted one more thing. Is yeah. Thank you for uh, figuring out how to show the video tonight. I would encourage people. Uh, now, I know that Neil's video uh, on, on his YouTube channel you, you saw that today. Now, Derek also did one. It's currently on his Patreon account. James uh, does a lot of videos with these guys. Uh, James, I don't know if you know how long it is before he'll release that to his YouTube channel, but at some oh, can, point, Will, those that, yeah, don't, just, those that don't want to wait. Yeah, go ahead. 30 days usually, Ross. I, no. I joined... I okay. joined Patreon and I, I'm on uh, Myth Vision because of James, but, but it's it's cheap to join uh, and there's some really good stuff it's on. The low, 
others. It's what I joined too for the, but sometimes he'll put things out more, more quickly. Can uh, ask him if he would do us that courtesy. Yeah, you know, but he's trying to, yeah. you know, Patreon, for those of you who don't know, it, for people that are work, working full time, it's a way, way that they reward people that support them. So it would be like first. Then it goes, goes out to everybody. So it's just a matter of timing. But uh, uh, at the, I, I told him I'm cheap. I'm going on the lowest tier. So it's okay. We it's, also would like to yeah. mention that uh, uh, Dr. Tabor just recently did a lecture um, on the Shapiro School. Uh, did you post that link already, Dr. Tabor? I don't have it yet. No, I, of course, Flint Institute of Art. Mm -hmm. And once they give it to me, I'll and let everybody know. So. Awesome. Great. Okay, well, great. Thank, thank you, you all. And, we, you know, it's been a right, long thanks. time. Yeah. Still... Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Love you all. Bye-bye.